I promise I wasn't walking out the building. <clears throat> Join me in Galatians chapter number one, would you? Those are some good old songs, aren't they? Not even that old, but they're old and they're good, and so praise the Lord. Our praise and worship and song every Sunday is beautiful. I thank the Lord for the team of men and women that come to praise the name of the Lord our God. Last Sunday I kicked off our, our, uh, our year, I know it was our second Sunday last week and the last couple of Sundays kind of putting things together, but um, last week we passed out something that each one of you ought to have to be able to keep up with things. I know that you, a lot of you do uh, just things online, electronic or whatever, but is there anybody that would uh, that does not have a copy of this, maybe at home in your Bible, but would like one, would you raise your hand and our ushers will uh, expeditiously uh, get it to you. Anybody? Anybody has a couple, two or three? Go ahead and raise your hands and they'll make sure that they, they're really, really fast, this, uh, this bunch of ushers. They're really, really fast. So, wow, you guys, that's good. Now, is there anybody else now? Now, there'll be some in the uh, lobby and... Um, if you can grab one of the ushers or somebody from the welcome, welcome team, the Info Hub, uh, that would be great to be able to have one of these. We also make sure that anybody who is visiting gets one of those as well so they can be uh, informed a little bit of what's going on with First Bible Baptist Church. They may not know why we're doing what we're doing, but they can surely figure out a little bit of what and then ask questions and have you be in a place, hopefully, where all of you would be able to answer those or at least find a leader in our church who could help them understand. If you look in this real quick, on the back it does have our weekly uh, schedule, our weekly offerings of things. So keep in mind our, our Saturday mornings uh, has our, our men's prayer. Uh, and then, of course, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, there's a Bible study Wednesday night for the investors. They had a great time this past uh, Wednesday, there was uh, lots of people there and online. Tuesday night is our young singles, our young adult ministry, young adults, uh, young marrieds in the coffee house. So there's, uh, there's a, just a little bit of a schedule on Sunday mornings. Of course, the investors get together right now. There's a Sunday group meeting, uh, a bunch of adults in kind of a Sunday school setting uh, over in the cafe. So there's, there's some of those things for Sundays and then other days of the week. Uh, so please uh, be informed a little bit. And if you've got any questions... Ask, and we'll do all we can to, uh, to meet the, uh, or bring the answer to your question and meet the need that you have. A study in the book of Galatians. Uh, there's a, a pastor locally around here by the name of Greg Axe. He has preached and taught here uh, in the past. He wrote a book long ago called, uh, of course, very simply, a study in the book of Galatians, Give Me Liberty, Give Me Death. And on the book it says, on the back of it says, if you're the type of Christian with a disposition of someone who looks like they were baptized in lemon juice, who thinks everyone should follow your rules because you say so, your bubble will burst in this book. Go ahead and buy it because I can use the money, he says, in parentheses. But don't read this book. It will probably upset you even more. <laughs> Give it to someone who can get something out of it. However, if you've ever gone to church and been told how wrong everything you do is, if you wonder whether the blowhards and biddies in the church live like they tell others to do, excuse me, they live like they tell others to, if you are looking for something real in this plastic banana world we live in, then this book is for you. So this, of course, is a commentary on the epistle of Paul to the Galatians. How do you get a hold of that? I don't know if he even has any more copies, but, you know, uh, you'd have a great, you'd have a fun time reading it. And it, it is really a, a fun look at, but also doctrinally solid, theologically written on the money study of and commentary on the book of Galatians. We're going to study the book of Galatians over the next few weeks. And so today I want to give you a little bit of a, uh, an introduction and talk a little bit about it. It will tie to live faith, love others, and declare hope as we have spoken about over the last few weeks when we uh, spoke of the Acts 2 project and then uh, progressively speaking, we looked at the first of the year, uh, our first Sunday of talking about this tagline of First Bible Baptist Church that we looked at, First Thessalonians as well, one of the model churches, one of the early model churches. 
And, uh, and they were awesome. Now, this church of Galatia, the churches of Galatia, not so model. And this book was written for a different reason. This letter was written, and uh, many would say it's a companion to the book of Romans because it has so much doctrine in it. And I would, I would agree that it has a, a, really a, a big load of doctrinal sorting from what your salvation is all about. Uh, what you have in your salvation, and as the theme speaks of, that you will really understand what it means to be free to live faith. You see from the artwork that there is uh, chains at the bottom, and that faith breaks them, which behooves our most important uh, first commercial, and that's, uh, well, i got to get you ready for the football game. They do have commercials, don't they? Just kidding. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Immediately in verse number 10, Paul talks about we now being saved are his workmanship. And of course, the book of Ephesians points to what the church ought to be. How that believer ought to be in the church and how the body of Christ ought to function. It teaches us about faith and really a lot about what the church would look like if we're really going to handle on what the doctrines of the church are and then, of course, the living out by grace through faith. When you think of the book of Galatians, and I hope you've turned there. If you haven't, go to Galatians chapter number 2 for a minute as part of our introduction. I want you to think that, hey, Galatians, really, their theme and purpose is, uh, the book is really justification by faith. And it is apart from works. It deals with some of the things, again, that Romans deals with. When you think of what Romans deals with and showing us that it is, our salvation free, and how clearly we are to be saved by the grace of God, we also realize in Galatians that we are to serve free, that we have the opportunity, for by grace are you saved through faith, we also in our sanctification should live the same way, that we serve God through his grace by faith, that he gives you the opportunity to serve. And so Galatians really gets into this. It shows us that we're justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And it really is a book that's correcting wrong teaching, bad theology. And of course, part of what our study will bring out is something that we'll find in Acts 15. We'll look at that here in a little bit. That in Acts 15, as Paul and Barnabas are returning from their missions journey, that they get back and give a report of what's going on. They hear some teaching that's been going on from Jerusalem. They make their way up to Jerusalem, and now they have a little bit of a disputation. And the Bible says no small disputation between Paul and Barnabas versus Peter and some of the teaching of the Judaizers are saying, yeah, now that you're saved, you need to now follow the law to keep your salvation. Now that you're saved, you need to serve by the law and you need to do everything that man tells you to do. That's kind of fun when you look at the, uh, listen to the back of the writing of a pastor. I believe that Greg Axe has been pastoring for 30 plus years easily and he's a tremendous Bible teacher and he's coming from a place of of great experience, and, and so when Paul the Apostle is reading the, writing this corrective letter, he starts out in verse number one, I'll go back to there, verse number one in chapter one, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you, and peace from God the, the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This book was written and had to be written after Acts 15 and that interaction, that disputation, and so it's been put at around 51 to 58 A.D. I will say this, that there is some uh, maybe 
uh, just a difference of opinion when it comes to some theologians of whether it's the southern part churches of Galatia or the northern part, and, and that would set things up according to the journeys of Paul and how he came back. But to me, it has to be written after Acts 15. You can't write of something that hasn't occurred yet. And of course, he does mention his interaction from Acts 15 in this letter. If you looked at Galatians 6, verse number 1, you're reminded, brethren, if a man be overcome in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such as one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. He's speaking from the place of, hey, brethren. So he's speaking of those in Christ. So we can say that he's speaking to some Christians and some believers, yes, but also to the church of Galatia could be the same as today, that it could have people that aren't believers, that aren't brethren in Christ, that again go back to the place of brethren that are teaching false doctrine or twisting some things up and theology needs to be corrected, doctrine needs to be corrected, or uh, also for some of the brethren in, in chapter number six, it gets to that point where really they deal, uh, Paul deals with the practical application of everything that is being taught and you come back to this place of saying, okay, how does this all fit? It's still live faith, love others, and declare hope. This is why we're going to sit up on live faith for this year and go through this study. We'll be in this study for a few months and then we'll go into another study in the Word. But when we say, hey, this outline that we're looking at today, really, I'll just read it this way because somebody, I just took it as a quote and I wrote it down because it sounded really, really good. But can I get to heaven by my good works? Well, Romans takes care of that. Can I earn God's favor after I am saved by the things I do? Galatians takes care of that. So you and I, again, when it comes to salvation, it's not by works. Romans really deals with that. And salvation, of course, is dealt with a little bit in the, the letter, the epistle uh, of Paul to the Galatians. But he really is talking of this servanthood of service and really saying, okay, I got it. I cannot earn God's favor after I'm saved by the things I do. But anyone who's looked in the mirror really recently would probably say, I've done that a little bit. Hopefully you've only done it a little bit. But in church culture, sometimes we perpetuate that message. We don't intentionally desire to do so. As I think about my salvation and coming to know the Lord in the mid-80s, the early to mid-80s, uh, back, uh, gosh, that's a century ago, I think. But I, I've said that I was... Uh, I was a religious person that grew up in a, in a Catholic religion. I, again, I always say, and I appreciate my father and mother teaching me the character of God. They did not, though, teach me about relationship with Jesus Christ. They taught me, though, religious principles. One of the things they taught me is that God's always watching you. Just remember when you leave the house, God's always watching you. Well, they're right. Guess what? God's watching you. <laughs> but sometimes we say it in a mean, condescending, cynical way. God's watching your actions, and if you don't do things to please him, then he'll never bless you. But on the other side of it, as I learned that Roman Catholic style and remember that religious style, I thought it was really easy for me to get saved and join a Baptist religion and the one that I joined into because it was almost like switching from religion to religion. But now I had the Bible, and it was awesome. I am not at all criticizing the early discipleship and the many years and the foundation that God built in me through many, many faithful men. What I'm saying is it easily produced a guy that could say, hey, I'll do that just to make Mike Curtis happy. But I might want Mike happy, but I need to learn that free to live faith will then, in turn, eventually get you to see that you're pleased because I'm pleasing God. But if I just objectively say, I'm going to please this man because Mike Curtis is now the pastor of the church and I want him to be happy with me. Did you know, Mike, you're now the pastor? So you're the pastor of the church and everybody's going to do things to make you happy this coming week. Okay, everybody go with that. This is Mike Curtis. He's got a great beard. He's really, really awesome. He's got two kids, wonderful wife. So you can just do everything to please him this week. See, that fit beautifully for me as a religious person until God really broke my heart and allowed me to see through the preaching of the Word of God, but also through 
the Holy Spirit and through the learning of the Word of God that there's something about living a life that's pleasing to man and have it be done as the paramount reason why you do things instead of it being the overflow in your life of the grace that God's bestowing upon you and how you're just living it out by faith and man will be pleased because, of course, I'm doing that which God would have me to do. You see, a study in Galatians is kind of like a dangerous place. It's a dangerous epistle. What is this dangerous epistle from Paul designed to teach us? That we are to live our life by faith. As Pastor Greg Axe says, this commentary of Galatians skewers the sacred cows of religion and the silly man-made rules that have rendered many a traditional church dead. There is no tolerance for sin in this book, but a refreshing liberty to live life as God intended for a believer in Jesus Christ. If you want to know how to be led of the Spirit and not under the law, this book will do the trick. And of course, this book is pointing to this book, which is the book of Galatians. So, what, was, what is this book designed to teach us? Well, here's a couple. Law living often becomes the most popular substitute for Holy Spirit living. It's easy. Just do as you're told. It almost becomes a misguided motivation for doing what's right. Does God get honored and pleased if you obey him? Yes, of course. But I've heard that the obedience and sacrifice thing can be something to really study out. I really believe that sometimes we have a way of doing again some of the things of the word of God without the right motivation. This is not a study on, hey, I've got a liberty to do whatever I feel like doing. That's not what the Bible teaches. There are a lot of if-then principles in the Bible. But what it's designed to do is come across just as Paul the Apostle dealt with exactly what he dealt with in writing this letter to the, church of Gal the churches of Galatia. Go to Acts 15 for a moment real quick, and I want you just to have a little bit of proof of things and what they did and what happened back then. In Galatians 15, excuse me, Acts 15, verse number 1, we're reminded again of what I said earlier. Paul's returning back. As he's returning back from his first missionary journey and him and Paul, Paul and the Barnabas are, are coming back, it says in verse number one, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. What are you talking about? Well, they have returned back to Antioch, their sending church, as it says in verse number 27 and verse number 28, and they're really thrilled about what they're sharing about all the things that went on in their missionary journey, but then some Judaizers come down. And some of the Judaizers are saying, hey, this gospel of Jesus Christ, yeah, you got that, but now we're going to add a little bit more to the gospel and be a false gospel and saying, hey, you know what you're supposed to do? Except you be circumcised. Again, verse number one, after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When, therefore, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go to Jerusalem to straighten this thing out. Oh, wait a minute, I misread that. It says, go unto Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Because, see, law living often becomes the popular substitute for Holy Spirit living. But if we live in Christ, as it says up on the screen, let us also walk in the Spirit. Galatians chapter number 5. So this has got to be a spirit walk. It's got to be a faith walk. We've got to be looking at this thing as free to live faith. And that's what Paul's saying. But here we have Judaizers and religious people almost 2,000 years ago doing the same exact thing that people do today. Let me tell you a better way. Let me tell you to add something. Let me tell you to take off your attention on the Lord Jesus Christ and heavenly things and the Holy Spirit and take the word of God and look at it this way and say, okay, you know what? It's a different life. You should live a different life than the way that the Bible's teaching. Or take a little bit of the Bible and mix it into your religion way and just say, okay, that's nice. Well, the Holy Spirit frees us to live in liberty and not in bondage. You see, you're free to live. 
in liberty in Christ. Which means you got all the freedom to do that which God would have you to do. It's beautiful. It's sweet. It's one of the things that we'll teach through when we get to Galatians chapter number 5 and 6. It does say that we're to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So again, looking at what it says in Acts chapter number 15. You go down to verse number 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversation, excuse me, the conversion of the Gentiles. They're declaring the testimony of God, saving souls and planting churches. They're talking all about the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Wouldn't it be great to hear how the mission journey went? Of course it would. When Brian gets home here next week, please be praying for him that he, as he tries to get back into the United States, his flight is due this coming week. With everything that's going on, just pray that God will protect him. He knows he's in God's hands to get him safely home. But, hey, Brian, what, what happened the last few months? You've been over in Africa for a while. Give us a report. And they talk about things, and it's so full of joy and all those things. Well, something came up here. Verse number five. But there arose, excuse me, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. So the wonderful religious geniuses of the day, the higher-ups, the religious mucky-mucks, the Pharisees, they believed but they also believe with a little ad, let's take away the grace. Let's now teach them how to do works after salvation to keep their salvation. And that's totally against what the gospel is teaching. What goes through your mind when you hear free to live faith? Are you free? Yes. If you're saved and born again today, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. But what goes through your mind when you hear free to live faith? Well, I just don't need to do anything. I don't need to go to church. I have freedom to do so. I don't need to read the Bible. I have freedom to do so. I don't have to witness to people. I have freedom to do so. That is not what the Bible says. You're being contrary to what the Bible says. You're being contrary to what God has said. His statements, his statutes, his testimonies, his precepts, his commandments all trump any of your carnal fleshly thought. So you need to get that thought into your mind so that you have the mind of Christ. And then you say, oh, mind of Christ, free to live faith, hallelujah, can't wait for the next thing that I can do by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. Go back to Galatians chapter number 2. So are you reminded of something very, very important here? I'm going to read this verse that's up on the screen here in a moment. But I want you to start with me in Galatians 2 verse number 16. Because some of you that have learned this passage of scripture deeply. How many of you, by the way, have, have memorized Galatians chapter number 2 verse 20? Raise your hand. Wow, that's awesome. Verse 21 maybe, some of you too, maybe 21, but maybe 16, maybe verse number 16. Good stuff here because here we are with really the centerpiece of what we need to grab a handle on when it comes to free to live Christ. Verse number 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Remember, theme and purpose. This statement is being made here, and it's a big statement. That's the overall purpose of this letter. Justification is not by the law, it's by faith. It's one of the doctrinal theological parts that Paul will cover in chapters number three and four, but this is kind of like a prelude to chapter number three and four. Verse number two is telling us, hey, no man, the man that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. So it's not your justification, but it's the justification of Christ that's put upon you, correct? That's the doctrine of it. You say, by faith, I had no idea what was going to happen to me. But after being saved now 10 years and learning the Bible, wow, justification is powerful. Justification is so freeing. Being justified by faith, you're being justified by the work of Christ. So you're justified by the justification of Jesus Christ. 
So when you look at that verse and you see this, you go, okay, I'm justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no man be justi- no flesh be justified. Does that mean we throw the, fl- the, the uh, law out? No, we don't throw the law out. We need to have the law because the law does something. It reveals to us that we're transgressors. It reveals to us that in our flesh and no dwelleth no good thing, but in the spirit we're free to live faith. We can live two different kinds of lives when you're born again. But by the way, when you're not a new creature in Christ, you only can live one kind of life. And that's a life of condemnation, and you're going to go to hell for the rest of all of eternity. But when you're born again, you can live one of two lives. And Paul the Apostle is making it clear, as clear as can be, in this letter to the Galatian peoples, that church is those churches. Hey, you're crucified with Christ, nevertheless you live. Verse number 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore... Christ, the minister of sin, God forbid. When I was looking for the truth of the word of God and what it meant, and I started going to Bible studies and asking all kinds of questions, someone gave me the Bible and told me to read the book of Romans. I've shared with that a hundred times. And what I'm saying is the word of God showed me that Christ is not the minister of sin, but that Christ revealed to me that I am a sinner, and that I'm the one who has this burden upon me that I need to give to him who's going to take care of the burden because he's the one who can only justify me. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that we forget what we live in. You see, just rehearsing doctrine frees you to go, I need to live by faith. Just like I was, for by grace are you saved through faith. Oh my gosh, for by grace are ye saved through faith. You can live your life just like that all day long. Because the works that you do are an overflow from faith and not an overflow from you attempting to earn the favor of God. You and I cannot earn the favor of God. What about all the if-then statements in the Bible? That's God telling you like you do as a parent or an older person to a younger person. If you do that, I promise you this will happen. What are you talking about? I've experienced that mess. If you live in a certain way, it'll come back to you. If you do not read your Bible, you will be dry. If you do not make things right with God, you will grow harder. If you don't do what the Word of God says, you'll become self-righteous and self-sufficient, and you will need no one. And if you distance yourself away from God, like this world wants us to distance from ourselves because of the sickness, and you take that and you go spiritually crazy with that, you can distance yourself so far from God that you can close the Bible and say, I don't want to hear anything anymore. I promise you that life will be absolutely miserable. How do I know that? From experience. Just like you, if you've ever experienced it. I pray you would not experience that miserableness of living away from God. If you are, come on home. Coming home. Coming home. Never more to Rome. I love the story of the prodigal son coming home to the prodigal father. But I love that prodigal father standing there waiting for the prodigal son. And that's what he waits for. Paul is preaching and speaking and teaching from experience. So are we not. Verse 18, for I build again the things which I destroyed. I make myself a transgressor. What? If I bring back the law to please God, to try and earn my way to heaven, to do works that are based upon flesh and fear and not upon faith and grace. Verse number 19, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I can't do anything to get myself to a place where I'm better if I do a certain bunch of laws. I am free just to do what God commands me to do just because I love him. It's that old simple illustration. You get your children to a place where they understand the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord, that is huge. Wisdom is the principal thing. If you think that not teaching your children to fear the Lord, you're a foolish person. You better teach your children to fear the Lord. But one day, you will understand, help them understand, you can fear the Lord in the proper way, and guess what? He will love you beautifully with his perfect grace. And he'll never, ever, ever stop loving you unconditionally, just like I love you unconditionally, my child, no matter what you do, no matter how much you screw up your life. Always love. 
Because then he goes into this famous strong verse in verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. By the way, don't you like, like oxymorons in the Bible? You're a living sacrifice. Doesn't make any sense. You are alive, yet you're crucified. Have you ever seen anyone that was crucified living? They're not. <laughs> but I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Thank you, God, for your grace. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Excuse me. I live in the faith of the Son, by the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. As you know, what it's saying there is this very simply. We spoke about it a little bit in highlighting Brian Calloway, Pastor Brian's messages from the Acts 1-8 conference. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So my life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Did the Son of God have any faith? Kind of a little. Did Jesus Christ have some faith? That's the kind of faith I'm to have. That's the kind of faith that we're to live in. That's the kind of faith when you come back to this works and faith thing, you go, I'm free. You're free. Christ in you makes you free. Christian, you are free. So you don't have to wait for me to tell you to do something. Now, biblically, by the order of the church and by having pastoral things and deacons and elders and there's leadership, there's, there's direction and there's a principle of, of, of leadership and servanthood and, and it's all throughout the New Testament, yes. But you know how freeing this can be if we say, okay, I'm free to live faith. There's not a pastor in the world that wouldn't love to preach and teach and lead a church that everybody says, hey, you don't have to tell me what to do because I already know what to do. Now, I don't mind telling you what to do because it's God's calling, not because it's something in my flesh that I'm supposed to do. It's God's calling for me to tell you, thus saith the Lord. It's God's calling for me to speak of what the Bible says, and this is what God would have you to do. But I'm just saying today, if you and I would look at the book of Galatians and say, okay, this is going to be a neat study. What is God going to show you? What does God want to show you? So just for the next few minutes, I want to give you an overview. Chapters 1 and 2, we're going to give them a, a, a title kind of a, in our outline. And so chapters 1 and 2 will have something. Then chapters 2 and 3, excuse me, 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6. Three different ways in which, and, and I really like the way this lays out. And then it gives us a reference point. So Galatians 1 and 2 first. Paul's personal testimony of what? There's only one gospel. When I look at what the Bible says and what it teaches, if you look at Galatians chapter number one, again, I read through verse number five. Let me read verses number six and seven. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I am, I am just mystified. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I can't believe that you who are born again, that are saved, that are called to the grace of Christ, are now looking at a different gospel, another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So he's talking about the perversion of the gospel. When you look at those two verses up online, you see up on the screen, you see that verse number six and verse number seven are really, really key here. Because Paul is saying, look, I realize what's happened right off the bat in my letter to you, that you're not living a life like the life that salvation produces in the life that Christ has given you for sanctification to produce as you grow in the grace and knowledge. In fact, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. This other gospel is a perverted gospel. As it says in verse number seven, but, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel. It's not just, oh, by the way, this is something else. It's a perversion. Paul says, I am uniquely qualified only by the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been called by God to the Lord Jesus Christ to do that which I'm doing. 
Well, the gospel is the exact same way. It's a unique gospel. It's the only gospel. There's the only one that saves. And one and only gospel means anything other than that, antichrist, perversion. And that's what Paul's saying. You are messed up to think that you could be so easily persuaded and dissuaded to go into this place of living by a set of rules to make people and man the object of your affection instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, doesn't the Bible teach that we're to love one another, be kind one another? Yes. But that's an overflow out of being free to live faith. It says then, in chapter number two, as we're reminded, as I just read, in verse number 20, and I read verses number 16 down through 20. Look at verse number 14 of chapter number two. See, remember, this is Paul's personal testimony of what the gospel's all about. And it's only one gospel, the unique gospel, and the calling of God. And he humbly puts himself before them and says, look, I know the truth of the Bible. I've been taught it by God, and I want to just declare it to you. Verse number 14 of chapter 2 says, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, which goes back to Acts chapter number 15, I said to Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Do you really think we're supposed to, again, trade religions? That's what my friends and, and family said to me up in New Hampshire when I went back after, tell, after I got saved and went back after in an off-season and said, hey, you know, I, this is about Jesus, and, I, and I, well, what church are you going to? Well, I haven't really landed on a church. Well, what church are you going to? Well, I'm going to a Baptist church in Rochester, New York. Ah, oh, so you switch from one religion to another. And that's the way they see it. When Cheryl came to know the Lord as Savior, but still living underneath her mother and father's uh, covering in her home before we got married. They would say the same thing to her sim similarly in this way. Josie, Cheryl's mom, gave up her religion for Milt, her father, Josie's husband's religion, which is Jewish. So you just traded religion. So that's all you did. That's a crazy testimony of the way that people see it. But understand this. Paul saying this church and these believers were following after something that Peter had brought to them. Peter, the apostle Peter. And of course there's other Judaizers, people that have been in a place of living for the Jewish religion and they, being a Jew, would say, hey, wh why? Why are, you, why are you living? Why are you living this way? Paul saying to Peter, why are you living this way? You don't want to have them live after this manner and live after that manner. You want them to live faith and live this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Galatians 3 and 4. Galatians 3 and 4 comes. Paul's doctrinal teaching of the justification by faith. When you see this, you go, okay, this is the next piece. Paul's doctrinal teaching of the justification by faith. And that's found in chapters number 3 and 4. What is Paul doing? He's really, really teaching strong about what faith is to these believers. He's saying, hey, churches at Galatia, do you understand that you're justified by faith, by nothing else? And that doctrine of justification is very, very strong. When you look up on the screen, you see verse number, uh, in chapter number 3. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and turn that, guys. By that, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Verse number 11. And if you just keep on going down, verse number 12, the law is not of faith. Uh, but that the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, it is written, Cursed is everyone that hang on the tree. And he goes down and he starts breaking out the Old Testament versus the New Testament. We're going to get into that, of course, much deeper. But Paul's doctrinal teaching is really, really huge because, again, he brings in a, do a, a doctrine that's so very, very important, which frees us to live faith. Also, when we see what he brings to us again in chapter number four, and it says up on the screen, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God. When you see, again, what's going on here, when Paul's teaching this, it goes back to verse number one. And, and verse number seven, we're gonna get to, but look at verse number one. Now I say that the heir, 
as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he is be lord of all, but is under tutors and government, governors until the time appointed of the father. He's definitely speaking of what it would be like to be part of an earthly kingdom and be honorable to an heir as a child just like a servant would be and you would have that responsibilities but he moves it to us being heirs of God watch this verse number three even so we when we were children were in bondage under the elements of the world but when the fullness of time was come God sent Forth a son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now that's, that's to me so freeing for you. So, such a reminder. Again, this is a corrective letter. This is something that needs to be corrected in so many of our lives. Simple illustration. As we go to the next piece in Galatians 5 and 6. Go ahead and put that one up there. Think of this. We use this illustration in sports a lot. But it happens in regular life. Maybe you have a discipleship lesson or you go to, get, go to a Bible study or a small group or last, yesterday morning we had a great time in prayer and, and then at the end we, we prayed for Gonzo and uh, Rafael Gonzalez is off on a, another deployment and he's flying right now to be in the Middle East and you, you think, okay, well that, that is just, that's a really big day and it's really neat and boy, after that I felt so good. I really had just a, just a neat feeling. Bobby, you know, like you, we just walk away from that time. Wasn't it good? Any of you that went to, it was just really a good time, and you walk away and go, man, I just wish that we could have just a spirit-filled time like that all the time, right? And then something comes up. Life comes up. Something hits you, and you can default into your normal carnal fault of saying, okay, I'm going to yell and scream and holler at that issue. I'm going to take, I'm not going to take any prisoners. I'm going to take somebody out. Well, wait a minute, an hour ago, you were just living in the spirit. You were living by faith. You were walking in a spirit-filled time. You go, you see, when God gets a hold of you and you're free to live faith and you live in that place where the Spirit of God's leading you in that spirit-filled life, then guess what? The doctrine of the justification of faith isn't just a doctrine that you pick out whenever you need to justify your faith. It's a way of you looking at the way you're supposed to live every day, which leads to Paul's teaching in Galatians 5 and 6, that all the time, you can live a spirit-filled life. Chapter number five, verses number 22 and 23, as you think about, again, the fruit of the spirit, a lot of times you say, oh, the fruit of the spirit, that sounds great, love, joy, peace, long, suffering, blah, 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 and we wheel them off really fast. We go, I really have a hard time with a couple of those things. I don't really even know if they're even real fruit, because I mean, they're like pomegranates or something like that, or, or maybe they're like a kiwi. I don't know, I don't even like those fruit. That's the way we look at things. This is God's fruit. I got a text Saturday morning from my son-in-law. My son, he says, hey, uh, my granddaughter, uh, Maddie and I, we made muffins this morning, but we couldn't make blueberry muffins, so we had strawberries. We made strawberry muffins, LOL. I went, way to go. Whatever fruit you have, make them. And that was great because my, daughter, my, my granddaughter loves fruit. She loves all kinds of fruit. Just like the Lord and putting in you. He loves all that fruit too. And he le loves to see all that fruit in you and me. He gave it to you and he gave it to me. What we do with this, the fruit of the Spirit, capital S, is love, joy, peace. Not the fruit of your spirit, which is contention, dissension, argumentativeness, self-sufficiency and self-righteousness. This is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. God can't bind that. God's not going to bind that. You are free to operate because there's no law coming down to stop that fruit. He wants that fruit to come out. But you know what the law <laughs> that gets in the way of that is of my own making, my own sin. As Paul the Apostle says in Romans chapter number 6 and 7, and he teaches off that law of sin. As I finish up this thing, look at verse number 14 of chapter number 6. 
as we see Paul's practical teaching of the spirit-filled life. When you see that verse, you go, and it starts out here a little bit earlier than that because Paul is really trying to get something across here. He says, verse number 13, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. That's why they want you to do that. They want it to be a flesh walk, not a faith walk. They want it to be a filled with the flesh and not filled with the spirit walk. Those are those that want to have the control over you when God says, I want the preeminence and control over you through the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. So he says in verse number 14, one of the most profound verses you're going to find in all of this letter. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. I'm dead to the world, and the world is dead to me. When I say, I glory only in the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which, on which my Savior died, when you look at Paul's statement, and he says, the world's crucified unto me and I unto the world. This, was, this is maybe your homework assignment this week. It'll get you through when everything hits on January 24th. I mean January 20th. Whatever it is, it'll hit. Because the world's crucified to you, believer. Now, if you're lost today, then the world's all you got. If you don't, by faith, believe that Jesus Christ is the remedy and the answer, then what will go on is free to live by faith. It'll be your own faith. And I know one thing about me. When I live by my faith, it's really pretty messy. But when I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me, it's a whole different story. What does God desire to make right in you through this sermon series? Free to live faith. Would you please bow your heads for a word of prayer? Now, as I pray here in a moment, you can take that opportunity to get up, excuse yourself, and come forward and, and pray with the Lord and answer that question with the Lord. He's the one that the question is really being asked from and the answer to. What does God desire to make right in each one of our lives through this sermon series? Paul preached and taught through his letter about this personal testimony he had. He preached and taught on that practical life being spirit-filled, and he preached and taught on the doctrine of justification. Where are you at in regards to all that today? Maybe today is the day where you just talk to the Lord and drop some things off. Our Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ in this invitation time. And as we gather, and I know it's just a simple time and just a couple of minutes, but it's a very important time. I just pray, Lord God, you'd have your way in this church, in your people, in the believers. I pray, God, as we're, we're gathered together in this unity, in this, in this cohesiveness by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, by the doctrine and the truth and the testimony of Paul the Apostle and the, the evidence of the Word of God working by grace, are we saved through faith, and that our lives in Christ after salvation is a life similarly spoken. For by grace do we live by faith. So I pray as we're free to live our faith that, God, we would do business with you openly and honestly in Jesus' name. Please stand as the music plays. Please take advantage of the opportunity to respond. The ball games, the football games await.
but the Holy Spirit of God working in your heart right now, that's something that maybe you just need to take time. Why don't you come? Why don't you come and do business with the Lord? Please come.